All right, well, thank you, first of all, for changing it up a little bit and uh, coming over here to Wasa East and uh, taking a tour of the career and technical education areas. February is recognized as CTE month in the state of Wisconsin, and so that's uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to spotlight our programs. We've got uh, a number of programs that we'll just kind of walk through, and we've, uh, we've got students and some staff members here tonight that will um, show you what they're doing, some of the projects they're doing, talk about the programs that we have. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're going to start here in, in Family Consumer. So Family Consumer Science, uh, we've got three main pathways here, or programs of study that we deliver in, in FCS as we call it. Um, the first one is culinary and, and we've got a lot of students in our foods classes. It's really our culinary program of study preparing students not only for with life skills, but skills that can be used out in our, our industry. And uh, the other areas are uh, early childhood education, which we know has got a significant need in our community. Um, we've just recently uh, connected with an advisory committee here in town through the United Way. It's called Baby Business, and our staff uh, are going to be, are gonna be um, participating in that advisory committee because uh, we, I'm sure many of you have heard too about the need for certified daycare um, and, and just what that means to us as a community. So our programs at both East and West are certifying students in early childhood education. We call it assistant child care teacher, but it is an industry recognized certification and, and so that's a big part of um, this, this particular department. Uh, the other thing is health science and family consumer department works really well with our health our health teachers so it's kind of a partnership here where um, they, they teach uh, a couple different classes in family consumer but also in our physical education department and so like medical terminology health occupations one health, health occupations two those classes are, are, are being uh, delivered both in our FIAD as well as our family consumer. So um, <clears throat> our teachers were not able to come tonight, obviously, because of the weather. So uh, they're not here, but I figured we'd, we'd take the opportunity still to show you the facilities that we have, and then we'll work down to business and marketing. So this is where our foods class is, and, and um, we have a, a wonderful classroom lab here. Um, a lot of times, yeah. Other, other schools that are uh, looking at expanding or, or going through the referendum process, they'll come through here and take a tour and kind of just take a look at our layout because it is uh, an ideal lab setting for our culinary program. We've got uh, the commercial refrigerators, we've got um, the learning tables, as well as the different setups. So we're trying to um, replicate what what it is not only at home, but also out in the industry as well. So, uh, we're currently running Foods 1, Foods 2, and Foods 3 classes here. Um, I don't know, Mr. Sims, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but uh, one of the things you'll also, in this department that we do really well with, is youth apprenticeship. We have students that are involved in youth apprenticeship in this department specifically. Uh, in certified nursing assistants. So um, our students are taking a lot of field trips. They're going on a lot of tours, a lot of guest speakers in this area as well. So I would just say that that early childhood education piece that John mentioned, I mean, that was a real feature and fixture for my time when I was teaching and coaching at West to see those students that were under Deb Schweigert's leadership there walk over to AC Kiefer at all times and participate so richly in that 4K program. And I know the very same thing is true of the students that work um, here on the East Campus. So I think East and West, the experience that those students get, a number of them may end up going into early childhood education based on that interest. But I think it's one of the best pairings, strongest pairings that we've had that's benefited the district at a younger level as well. So specifically to that area, that, that's in our other classroom. We'll just walk over there right next door, take a look at that classroom, and then we'll keep moving. Just one, one just comment is that uh, we utilize our foods classes for catering, too. Um, and our students just do a great job. And I can't overemphasize the fact when they're dressed up with their uh, white tops and, and, and black slacks, they cater. It's different special events that we have here at school and uh, 
our teachers just do a great job of getting them prepared, very professional, so they're able to work with those soft skills too of, in the service industry that are so important. And I'm sure if today's school had been in session, they would have catered a lovely <laughs> spread for us. And actually, they do. They have taste testings. They have chili cook-offs. Uh, they invite the staff down. Uh, they're, they're always doing great things, you know. So one, one thing that I should mention, too, that's new here at Wasi East is we've just started up a student organization in this department. It's called the FCCLA, which stands for, I have to look at my notes, Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. And we've had that organization uh, in district, but not here specifically at Wasi East, so we're excited about that. Uh, Brad mentioned it a little bit, but really our student organizations, and you've heard from them before, at board meetings where uh, FFA and DECA students get up and present. But the one thing I, I, I tell a lot of people is our, our student organizations is where students are really gaining those soft skills and those leadership skills that we see. Um, the, the ability to think on their feet and, and conduct role plays and, and be in professional uh, situations. You'll see it again down in, in our business and marketing department in just a minute. We have, have a number of DECA students that are preparing for state events. And so they're, they're practicing with uh, business professionals and sitting down and, and going through interview processes. And, um, and, and so we're excited about that in here with, with FCCLA starting that up. The other thing I wanted to mention that we do um, in this department is dual credit. And a, a number of our students are earning dual credit so that they can um, take advantage of, obviously, post-secondary opportunities, earn some college credit while they're in our classes, save on tuition after high school, so. John, is there a future teacher organization? Um, so to that point, uh, we have a class that we call aspiring educators. And um, the whole, in here we call it a little, a little different name, careers with kids. Uh, but again, the curriculum is trying to introduce the world of education. And we, we actually, in fact, have a, a number of students that are interested in going into education. And so we're trying to uh, promote that class to those students so that, um, again, you know, we, we obviously need more teachers, right? And, um, and so that's where that lives. Now, as far as an organization or a student organization for education, I brought the idea forward to our staff members as something that you know we need to look at with with both of those classes. So that'd be a great extension w attached to that that class and that curriculum. So and something that we wanna we want we'd like to do in the future. And at the state school board convention, several schools presented childcare in their schools now that they've got empty classrooms or um, facilities that lend themselves to starting and helping the community and helping teachers and staff with childcare. And I think it was uh, Frederick and Grantsburg that have um, daycare in their schools, which is something that would really lend itself to, mm -hmm. to uh, what our community needs and would really help our kids. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really impressive how they've got that rolling. Yeah. So that, that's a lot of the discussion that's happening in those advisory committees with Good. baby business and taking a look at, and, and um, Kara, our 4K principal, is also in on those meetings as well. So a lot, a lot of those ideas are circulating in the community, which is exciting. And that's why we're also there at the table so that w we can align our programs with really what, what our community partners are looking for. Oh, good. And I think that's really, one of the things, obviously, you know, how do we solve that issue, right? So I'm, I'm glad we're plugged into it, and, and it's, it's great to have the United Way have, um, have that committee organized and so a lot of different resources too. Yes, yes. Okay. So. We're going large group here, Lee. We are. <laughs> Is this your job?
change. This is our Jack Shack. Um, actually, the name uh, came about at the Old East. We always tried, we wanted a school store, and we just didn't have the spot. But if we went back far enough, back into the early 70s, there was a school store at the original Lhasa High, and it was called the Jack Shack. So when we moved up here, we called it the Jack Shack. So why don't we come on in? We actually have a, one of the student managers here. Um, this is our Wasa School Board. I'll let her introduce herself and tell you all about our Jack Shack. Indeed. Talk about it. Okay, so this is our school store, and this is open during most of the hours of the day, and students can just come in here and buy, like if they need apparel for any of the games, or they can buy snacks and stuff in here. Right now we're actually running a, a fundraiser for our state DECA competition, which is next week. So we don't usually sell candy and stuff in here. Usually it's more of the healthy snacks. But since it's a fundraiser, we are allowed to sell stuff like that. What kind of hours do you have here? Um, it's open. So there's a schedule in Miss Poppy Gill's room. It just depends on if there's students available to work. They are. They do get credit for classes. So it's open probably seven out of the eight hours a day. It's a great learning lab, obviously, for both our business and marketing classes, and we try to kind of blend blend this into our curriculum along with our DECA events and and um, some of the things, some of the some of the events that happen in DECA are also blended in with our curriculum within our classroom as well. So, right, it's a, it's just a great application, and as Ms. Schlein says, it's open throughout the day. Normally, this soda is in here. Um, but they have some stocking to do. It was a, uh, uh, a snow day today, as, as you all know. But uh, this apparel is for sale, and we uh, <laughs> would, uh, you know, if any of you are, are interested in sporting anything from Wasa East, uh, cash register is open. If you have to use <laughs> but a lot of parents, right? I mean, you have to say, at the start of the year, a lot of parents are in here. This place is usually wiped out. And, it, and it's great. I mean, people are proud of this school, and our DECA uh, marketing classes do just such a great job of managing it and making sure. I mean, you could even get lumberjack chapstick. Um, but uh, they're in here throughout the course of the day, uh, and, and it's something we're very, very proud of. It's a, a, a store we're very proud of, and we're proud of the students that work here. So this is our business and marketing classroom, and our teacher, Mrs. Poppy Gale, here, uh, as well as our DECA advisor. So they've got a rather large event coming up here in the next couple months that all these students are here preparing. But I'll kind of hand it over to you if there's anything that you want to go through or explain sure. a little bit more. Sure. Does everyone know what DECA is? Yes. Okay, marketing student organization. So we have our state career development conference coming up. We have 15 students that will be going and competing there for an opportunity to go to our international competition in Orlando the end of April. And so they're all preparing with, um, I have a sample role play up here that they go through. They have to take a 100 question multiple choice test and then they receive a score and our top seven I think maybe this year it's top six competitors who will go on. So um, most of the students are in events like um, marketing, we have human resources, uh, we have an automotive, we have food marketing, business services, all kinds of different events that they'll be competing in. So, And this classroom is used for all the business and marketing classes, which includes everything from um, computer applications like Microsoft Office to accounting, marketing, hospitality, and tourism, sports and entertainment. We have an entrepreneurship class. So we have six different courses that are offered each semester. So we're trying to offer a variety of those. Some of those are offered dual credit through NTC. Um, one of the things that, that I would also add, and, and it's a theme in all of our CTE areas, is partnerships. And business and marketing is no different. What it looks like in here uh, is junior achievement. Business and marketing participates in junior achievement. We have a lot of JA volunteers that come in, um, go through different curriculums. Uh, I think right now 
the curriculum is the company store, so they're working on product development and then turning around and selling a product and, and uh, walking through that whole entire process. But um, you will hear the word partnership in all of our areas because it really is uh, a key element of our programs and what makes our CTE areas successful, right? And certainly in here, when, he, when we can get uh, business professionals from the community to come in and talk to our students, not just to deliver the JA curriculum, but also to share their experiences, uh, that, that is a pretty valuable experience for our students, so. Yeah, definitely, and we had volunteers in this year discussing business ethics, as well as entrepreneurship, and then if you noticed all of those things, it looked like cookies at a mm -hmm. first glance there. Actually, um, our product that we're creating through the JA Company Program, and we've been able to collaborate using the laser engraver in the Tech Ed Lab, as well as um, do our finishing in the Woods Lab with the ventilation that we need. So mm -hmm. it's really been a great opportunity for us to collaborate with several departments here, as well as individuals in the community. Any questions? One of the things you heard her mention is Microsoft Office. I would say that's one emerging area that we're trying to grow a, little, a lot more just because, again, our business and industry is telling us students that have certifications in Microsoft Office are employable. Both that, that is a skill that um, they can immediately go out into the world, into the workforce and, and use, right? So um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any, thank you. We're in our agriculture room, and I'm just going to hand it over and let you enjoy the show. Mr. Stashik is our teacher here, and uh, I will just add that Mr. Stashik teaches both here at East as well as at West. So, other than that, that's all you need. That's all. Right. That's all. all you need so, like I said, my name is Joe Stashik, and I do teach at both schools. Um, I'm just going to keep my part really short, and the kids are going to present to you. Uh, one of the big things that we have in the agriculture program is our FFA chapter. And that's what some of our officers here from both East and West are going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, we're also really lucky in the Wassa School District where we have a great Wassa FFA alumni group. Um, they give out six to $9,000 in scholarships every year. Uh, fun kids that go to national convention trips all over the country. Uh, buy ice cream and cheese curds for some of our fun stuff like Tracker Day. Um, <laughs> Just a great group of people that give all their time just for our kids, which is really nice. I um, appreciate it. So on my part, just to give you a little rundown of some of our agriculture stuff, um, we teach the same classes at East and West, um, so the curriculum is the same. Um, introduction to Agri Science and Conservation are two classes that freshmen can take and upperclassmen, but those are our introductory classes. Uh, we do a little bit of everything, so our plant systems, animal systems, natural resources, food science is all covered, as well as a little bit of egg marketing and introduction to Agri Science. And then conservation classes where we focus more on the natural resources and careers with that. We have great partnerships with the DNR. Uh, we have biologists and foresters um, that come in and work with our students and take them with us on field trips. So we have a great relationship with those. Once kids are older, um, we have some unique opportunities, especially that we are so close to NTC. A uh, vet science class is one of the first classes that kids can get dual credit in. Um, so that is all about animals and nutrition and genetics and some of those things. Uh, and then kids can link up with NTC and then that also transfers on to UW-Madison, Platteville, um, and other colleges. Advanced conservation is where we get into more of the ecology and forestry and soils. Um, if kids take advanced conservation and horticulture, um, they can also get a dual credit and introduction to soil science at NTC, so we split that up. Um, we have all three of those classes that are also science equivalency classes. And then finally, we have our youth apprenticeship program. Um, a lot of kids are transitioning from some of the more traditional farming type jobs into more of those supporting roles with that. Um, so vet clinics are really popular with our kids. Um, we have kids on goat farms right now, dairy farms. Um, we have kids going with foresters and doing different jobs with that. Um, so things are changing a little bit in the agriculture. It's not just our traditional farming anymore. It's broadened quite a bit. So with that, I will hand it over then and let the kids talk. <laughs> Okay, so of course we are from Wasa FFA. My name is Krita DeBalk, I'm the president at Wasa West. My name is Ava Gilliam, I'm the reporter at Wasa East. My name is Marshall Bulk, I'm the reporter at Wasa West. Alright, at Wasa FFA, we have 140 paid FFA members between East and West, which is pretty crazy knowing that. Kind of a smaller club, pretty awesome that we have the amount of people we do. Also, most members don't really come from farms anymore. We have a lot of people from cities, you know just outside of cities, different areas which really bring the club together and allow them to kind of have a really diverse membership. 
So each school has an officer team. There's six kids on each team. And we are an active club, so we are all year long, including the summer. FFA is amazing because we have something for everybody. We have lots of different competitions and areas of interest for people. And so no matter where you're from, what you like, you're going to find something with this club. So then the next thing we do is Food for America. This is one of our most popular events, actually. FFA members absolutely love this one. So we teach 10 five-minute uh, stations to fourth graders around local, uh, local dairy farms. And this year we taught 672 fourth graders. Uh, it's really cool. A bunch of fourth graders come out to farms. I was in the wildlife one, teaching them about deer, different things. They have a bunch of different stations, really kind of get them acclimated to farms, especially if they're not really from that background and they're not able to go out to farms a lot. It's really cool. A lot of fourth graders like it. All right, leadership and growth. That's a big part of FFA. We have members attend sectional, state, and national leadership workshops kind of involving the whole FFA members kind of being able to like allow them to interact and be able to kind of have interest in the same way and allow them to kind of come together. We do an officer camp out during the summer and it's really an amazing thing. We get to hang out together and bond a little bit. Um, we love being, I, I mean, I think that we can attest that every officer is just, we love being officers and we love being able to lead this one. Okay, so some career development events, we also call these judging competitions. So students are able to compete in teams of four in all sorts of areas of interest. It's something that we do every year. Our teams include forestry, wildlife, food science, vet science, forest, dairy, egg marketing, livestock, meats, and egg sales. Uh, this April we're going to Fox Valley Tech. We're going to com compete and see which FFA members do the best. The top 10% move on. You go to state and UW-Madison, and then from there they go to nationals. <coughs> Supervised agricultural experiences. Students take what they learned and apply it to other like agricultural experiences, but also experiments they do within the classroom, but also allows them to expand outside of the classroom. So FFA members compete and they get, well, and, and no, I'm sorry, they don't compete. Um, they attend educational requirements and they find businesses to bid and then sell their projects at the fair for a significant profit, which is pretty nice for us students. Yeah. So the next thing we do is agri-science fair. We do this in class, and so students can just design their own experiments and whatever topic they are interested in. So it's a way for students to really expand on what they love. And then students can choose to take this out of the classroom if they would like. And I'm sorry, this is the one we compete in also. <laughs> um, members are scored on interviews and their lab reports. Over the past couple of years, we've had a lot of people at Specifically, the past three years, we've had lots of members attend national convention. They've done really well. It's really cool to see us represent Wisconsin as a state. It's pretty cool. Okay, so the next thing that we love doing in Wausau FFA is public service. Uh, one of the most popular public service events is Wisconsin River Cleanup. So us, our FFA, and then other FFAs and classrooms around the area go to the Wisconsin River and we just pick up trash for like the entire day and we pull out tons and tons of trash each year and it's, it's a very um, popular event. The next thing that we do, or sorry, Marshall, you can help. <laughs> they, okay, so in the summer we teach uh, kids at the Ag Adventure Tent, Wisconsin Valley Fair. It's kind of one of those things just like Food for America, kind of get younger kids acclimated to agriculture. It's really cool to kind of see them. We do some fun stuff, but we also teach them and they really like it. And we also teach at the June Dairy Breakfast where we volunteer and we do anything they need. So it's pretty nice volunteer opportunities. And then every fall we do a turkey drive. And so with that we take Orange Friday and we sell ribbons for people to wear their orange. And then all the money that we make with all the ribbon sales goes to buying turkeys for families in need around our area. And so this past fall we raised money enough to buy 25 turkeys. We also grow lettuce in that amazing hydroponics unit we have at East and West, and it's really cool. We can grow lettuce, basil, whatever we kind of want, and we have different teams in horticulture classes being able to 
use it and keep track of it. It's really cool. We give it back to the school with their food pantries. It's pretty cool. We do a lot of fun things in FFA. Um, we just had a rodeo trip about a month ago. If we sell enough with a food sale or a fruit sale, you are able to go to the rodeo trip. We also have snow tubing, which is coming up next Friday, and a movie night. So kind of cool to get the FFA members involved and being able to, I don't know, have a fun time. We have the haunted corn maze, which is kind of scary, but um, that we bond as FFA members more doing that kind of stuff. And the FFA big buck contest, people can uh, submit their bucks that they have got during hunting season. And they tell a story about it, and it's pretty cool and pretty funny to listen to some of the stories. So, so our next event is Egg Olympics, um, something kind of small and fun for us. The next thing we do is Tractor Day, which is a school-wide event, actually. We have FFA members bring their tractors to school, drive them to school, and then the whole school can judge their favorite tractor, and the winner gets a little bit of money. Our alumni comes and brings cheese curds and ice cream for the entire school. So we, it's a good fun. We love our alumni. Yeah. <laughs> and then during the summer, we do a little Mount Olympus trip, just a fun summertime activity for all members. All right, and then our next thing is public speaking competitions. This is probably my favorite FFA event, for sure. So we have lots of members, they compete in prepared speech, which is my, uh, my event. Uh, we do extemporaneous job interview, creed speaking, and discussion meet. So any members, well we have a chapter competition first if we have a lot of people that want to compete. And then we go on to districts and sectionals, then state and nationals if we win. And so members in the top of course get to move on to the next one. And so what we wanted to do for you guys today, since this is something that's going on right now in our FFA, is give you a little demonstration on one of my speeches that I do every year. I just competed with this a couple weeks ago, and so I wanted to give it to you guys today. Okay, so the year, 2019. The characters, two parents and a child. The location, the grocery store. Go. The kid runs up to the parents saying, Mom, Mom, Dad, Dad, look, look, I found Pringles. Can we please get some Pringles? The mom takes the can, looks at the back, and reads, partially produced with genetic engineering. Pause the scene. The lights go up. There are two ways this can play out. One, the mom looks questionably at the Pringles and says, I don't think so, hon. Go find a different snack. Two, the mom turns the can back over, hands it to her child, and says, sure, honey. Why don't you put it in the cart for me? Back to the present. How would it feel to not know what is in that can of Pringles? How would it feel to not know what is in any of the food in your daily diet? We will not have to worry about this for much longer. Recently, the United States government put out a labeling law that will go into effect on January 1st of 2020. This law states that most foods made with genetic engineering will be labeled as bioengineered. To clarify, Genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, are organisms that have been manipulated in order to benefit humans. It is a good thing that GMOs will be labeled, because consumers, like that family from the grocery store, deserve to know what they're buying. It will allow people to relieve their irrational fear of genetically modified organisms, and it will allow people to support the GM technology. Firstly, consumers who deserve to look at the food products they feed themselves and their families and see what kind of ingredients they contain including any ingredients that may be genetically modified. GMOs are found in so many foods. 70 to 80% of all packaged foods contain them. Many soups, milk, cereals, frozen foods, baby foods, and fruit juice are in this category. It's good for families to know what's in the snack they tossed in their child's lunchbox or the food they're feeding their first baby. Just because many foods contain GMOs will be labeled does not mean people will refrain from buying the products that contain them. Many large companies in the food industry have already started to label their foods that contain GMOs. These companies would include Campbell Soup, General Mills, Kellogg's, and Mars. Families have not stopped buying these big brand foods just because they contain GM ingredients. So who's to say families will stop buying other brands as well? Finally, this labeling law will allow consumers to look at their food products and know if they're GMO or not. They should know so they can buy what they have determined is best for their families or just buy what they like and feel comfortable knowing what is in that product. People are scared of genetically modified foods because they do not know enough about them. 
Consumers have been eating GM ingredients for over 30 years, and GM crops are increasing rapidly. Once these ingredients are labeled, consumers will understand that GMOs are not harming them. Robert Fraley informs readers in his article, GMOs are a necessity for farmers and the environment, that in 2015, GMOs were planted on 444 million acres, an area larger than Alaska. That's 12% of all global cropland. GMOs are taking the food industry by storm and are becoming more and more common. Once these ingredients are labeled, it will be incredibly beneficial, so people can clearly see on their food labels that the 444 million acres of safe, GMO crops are going to their everyday diets. Genetically modified foods have been approved as safe for consumers, and so they should be labeled in order to get people to stop fearing those millions of acres of GMOs. A 20-member committee from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine found that GMOs have been blamed for multiple dangerous diseases, such as cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, obesity, and autism. The fact is, GMOs have not increased one's risk of developing any of the previously stated diseases. With genetically modified foods being labeled, consumers will not be so scared of GMOs once they realize they've been eating them for years and have not, have not suffered any health problems specifically from them. Once GMOs are labeled, consumers who believe in the future of agriculture can purchase products containing them in order to support the technology. Some people like genetically modified crops because they have proven to be good for our environment. In 2014, two German researchers from the University of Göttingen found that GMOs dropped pesticide usage by 37%. That's 37% less toxins and chemicals seeping into our natural water reservoirs, rivers, lakes, and streams. Peter Barfoot and Graham Brooks, two British researchers, took the time to find the impact of not using the tractor to spread pesticides. They figured that in 2014, the effect of not using the tractor was equivalent to removing nearly 10 million cars from roads. This is so great because it reduces agriculture's carbon footprint on the world. The combination of what would be removing 10 million cars from roads and using 37% less pesticides helps show consumers that GM crops are good for their world. Agriculture needs GMOs because they can do good for the environment and can produce more food. GM crops are increasing yields by 30%. To keep up with current production, an additional 97,000 more square miles, the approximate size of Wyoming, would have to be cultivated around the world. The usage of less farmland for higher yields is much needed because of the demand of food from the United States. Genetically modified crops are helping the environment and helping farmers keep up with the demand to feed the world. And some people encourage this and want to show support for GM crops by buying products containing them. The year, 2029. The characters, two parents and a child. The location, the grocery store. Go. The kid runs up to the parents saying, Mom, Mom, Dad, Dad, look, look, I found Pringles. Can we please get some Pringles? The mom takes the can, looks at the back and reads, partially produced with genetic engineering. She quickly turns the can back over, hands it to her child and says, Sure, honey, why don't you put it in the cart for me? This is a future world where people understand and accept the GMO technology. This is the world I want to live and raise my own family in. A world where producers do not have to fear being honest with consumers, and consumers do not have to fear GMOs because of unproven misconception. A world where science rules the day, and it is a better place for everybody. Thank you. Awesome job. Thank you. John, can I just say one quick yeah. thing? If you want to see a program school board members where East and West high school students work like this, and this is the result, when you see them when they come in as freshman FFA, and then they become upperclassmen, I mean, it is really a, just a shining gem of our school district. And that's usually where you'll see their teacher, Mr. Stashik, standing in the background, not saying a word but he is the force that brings them together and he's an amazing teacher. So what you're standing in is our graphics lab, our, our STEM lab, our maker space, whatever, whatever the, the trend word is, but this is really where uh, we have our graphics one, two, and three classes 
Uh, we've got a lot going on in here as you can see, but as we design this, uh, the space over there is our design space, right? And then we call this our dirty space where we, we make things, we design and build things here. Standing in that corner over there is a laser engraver you heard Mrs. Poppy Gale talk about collaborating with TechEd and, and lasering things uh, with, that, with that machine. These uh, are our t-shirt presses and dryers and, and then we do a lot of custom uh, vinyl and graphic decals, um, not only for community but also within our school district. Um, and so our students have a lot of jobs, right? And, and they're, they're working with customers, they're at times billing, they're talking about you know, the needs and wants of the customer and then tweaking designs and then, and then making here in this space. So um, it, used to be, it used to be more of the old fashioned print presses and things like that, but with obviously advancements in technology and digital, We've kind of moved from that old, that old print press stuff to more of the digital fabrication. So you see a number of different printers um, throughout this room. You also will see over here uh, our 3D printer. So again, students are um, working on the design and build aspect within the, uh, within the STEM areas, right? So as we slide over, um, we also get into our broadcast and photography area, a lot of graphic designing. So I will show you the, the Lumberjack broadcast space. So again, a lot of uh, this particular space was a result of a grant that uh, Liz Kisley and Paula Hayes from the, uh, from the library, um, they were able to um, win a grant. American Family Grant. Mm -hmm. And, and so with that came a lot of this equipment. That's uh, farmers. Farmers. Yeah. Oh, farmers. Farmers. farmers insurance. Gotta get that right. Um, yeah. And so as a result of that, we've been able to um, get all of this equipment. And so this is used a lot of different ways. Uh, number one, um, through school announcements, video announcements here at East, but also they've started to do some of the video pieces for the scoreboards. They put together some amazing videos for the Academic Career Planning Committee and, and that initiative within Wasa East. And so, uh, again, used a lot. We've got a core group of students uh, in that little community of video broadcasting that Liz has been fantastic with. Uh, but again, um, very fortunate to be able to have this, right? Not yeah. a lot of high schools uh, that I've been in ha have anything close to this. We, we have a similar but scaled down at West where uh, we've got a little smaller space, but again, we're, you know, pretty fortunate here at East to have that. Yeah, our weekly productions, the Lumberjack productions, I hope you get copies of those. Are they sent to you e no. each week? No. no. Really, it's a little student news segment, and it is tremendous. And one of the neat things about this are some of our students with special needs. They may they're amazing when it comes to being in front of a camera. And, and it, it, especially students with autism, they are, they flourish here. It, it's, it's really great. But what we're trying to transition is our newspaper, the Skyrocket. People just don't read the print anymore. So we've had a, a, a team of teachers together. They actually did a site visit uh, over in Alaska. And what we're trying to do is transition our, our uh, Skyrocket newspaper to more of a... Uh, live production like this, uh, computer, and we pick it up in a link. We're still in the developmental phase, but uh, that, that's what we're moving towards. So, yeah, like John said, very fortunate to have this resource. So, Emily Norgord, Kia, come on in. The only student around here or person who can actually get the thing done on the property. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I'm going to go to Jason Oviak, who's a teacher here. Um, and we had plans to run this machine as a demonstration, and we were just a, a few minutes late, but we're going to start it up again. And Jake, why don't you kind of talk us through what is what are we looking at here? 
Yeah, well, first, how does it apply? This is Emily Norgord, our rock star around here, uh, fully responsible for keeping this machine operating properly. Um, yeah, if you saw the Junior Girls stage set, that was almost 100% Emily. Um, yeah, so, we, uh, she drew this in about an hour the other day, kind of bootlegged something off the internet. Um, if you guys can't see it, just come in close. There's nothing that can hurt you at the moment. What this is is a plasma cutter um, controlled by a CNC computer controlled uh, machine. This file takes about 45 minutes to run, which in time would have been perfect, but things went later than we expected. So she's going to run a whole other one. Um, but you zeroed in bottom left. Is that your? Yeah, okay. good at the corner. So we, this middle would be too hard. Yeah, so, that, so we draw this on a uh, software called eCar. And uh, on that software, you can choose an origin point where, the, where it starts cutting from. And that was what we just said to each other. She chose the bottom left corner. You can choose any one of the four corners of the center point. Um, it's just good to remember where that is. If you zero up on the bottom left corner and you actually chose the center point, things happen that are good. I'm just going to do the top right to the corner of their bench. So she's right now zeroing the machine where she wants to start cutting. Her X and Y axis, um, X runs left and right from our perspective, Y forward and back, and Z is up and down. So she's set X and Y, and now she's lowering Z until that tip touches. As soon as it touches, there's an electrical current that's completed. A little light turns green on her screen over there, and she knows Z is zero. From all those points, the computer can now control that plasma head. Looks good. Great. Good. 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 Oh, okay. So, as we built these these uh, spaces, one of the things that we did was we held focus groups with a lot of the manufacturers. And one of the things, one of the big takeaways from all of those meetings was students that get experiences with CNC. And, and so you see that here with a plasma, a plasma table, CNC plasma table. You also see that over there in the milling machines. Those are CNC, you'll see it in the woods as well. But that was, a, that was a big takeaway when we talked to our business partners about what do you want to see in K-12 tech ed programs? And what should we be teaching? And, and so we got a lot of valuable feedback from them. And this was, this was a result of it. And I will also add that a number of those folks were also very instrumental in, in allowing us to get the equipment through uh, financial donations, right? And so a lot of those milling machines over there are brand new. Those were covered through partnerships and uh, support from, for example, the VA Esther Greenhack Foundation, the Judd S. Alexander Foundation, uh, along with a number of business and industry folks that I can show you that over, out in the hallway. We have a board showing kind of the, the business support. But, um, you don't want to see it? On the screen? See what she's looking at. It shows you before you actually do it. That's what it looks like on the computer. That's what it's going to cut. You want to watch it? One of these on. Yep, they're kind of they're special safety glasses. So yeah, so you can't look directly at this torch, so to speak. It's not quite as bright as a, a welding spark, but pretty darn bright. Unless you're wearing these green glasses or a welding helmet. If you'd like to watch it. Do you have a welding helmet on the camera? Sir? It, oh, that's right. You're going to be trying to look through the camera. Yeah, um, I can't, I can't do that. You can, wear, you can wear glasses and look through the camera with the glasses on. Um, no, that's all right. Right. Because uh, you aren't going to see much through the, through the helmet with the, with the camera. But we've got a bunch of welding helmets here if you want to watch. And, uh, green glasses. Watch this. Grab a helmet. Well, it's like kicked on and it'll darken for you. So, there you go. You want to go? Okay. 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 Okay.
say it right, but this is a, a, a particle board prototype. This costs six dollars for a four by eight sheet versus about eighty dollars for that much metal. So we'll run a prototype with an eighth inch router bit, which simulates the cut width on there. Before would that be about three dollars worth of material? We can see if it looks right, and then run it with steel. This is actually backlit. Yeah, I can't turn it on right now. If you look on the slideshow, you can see this. It's backlit with LEDs. It's a little purple or pink or whatever. So if we ever get it done and hung, you'll be able to see that on the side of their, their building. Katie, come on. No, no, no. Well, if you guys don't want to watch that, we could probably move downstairs. Josh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right. Show a couple of projects over here for the rest of your life. That's why they said keep the glasses on. So a lot of projects happening here, uh, a lot of hands-on learning. One of the things students are designing and building this trailer. So example is another example. All of our welding tables that we have, our students made them. Um, so we didn't have to we didn't have to go out and purchase all of those tables. Not the yellow, not the yellow tables, but our actual welding tables up against the boots. Those are all made by our students. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out here is so this is just raw material, right? But it's it's expensive raw material that is donated by business and industry. In fact, this bin was engineered and designed by Norland. They dropped it off full of full of steel for us. And any time that we run short of materials for students to use in welding. They come by, they scoop it up, they take it over to their plant over the weekend and they'll fill it up on the weekend and drop it off on Monday. So that is a significant cost savings to us. It's very easy uh, and we're very fortunate to have that in our community. And, it, and I should say it's not just Norland, it's a number of different people. All we have to really do is pick up a phone call when we're out of materials to use. And you'll also see that in our wood shop. We get our, a lot of our lumber from uh, Colby & Colby. They will provide us pallets full of, of lumber so that students have materials to use on projects and things like that. Not all, not all materials, but a lot, of, a lot of stock that you know our businesses have as surplus or maybe it's waste that comes off the line. So scrap metal, a lot of scrap metal. So, are there a lot of apprenticeships that come out of this and how, how job ready are kids when they graduate? So youth apprenticeship is very plugged in to all of our areas. Uh, it, it kind of comes and goes. Some years we have more industry that have a lot of openings for our students and sometimes we have more students than we have openings, right? And lately it's been more openings than we have students coming into it, but we still have uh, we still have a fair amount of youth apprenticeship kids, especially in manufacturing. It's taken a little bit for our industry folks to um, understand what youth apprenticeship is, because when they, when you say uh, a junior or a senior can come into your shop floor and work, they, they have a lot of questions about um, legality issues and young, young people. And, but through a youth apprenticeship program, they can in fact uh, work in a manufacturing setting. So there's some equipment they have to pay attention to, uh, like forklifts and things like that. But um, yes, it is. I would say it, it's growing. It's, youth apprenticeship is growing in manufacturing. What about job placements? How about the, what kind of record do you have in terms of kids coming out of here and ending up with hands-on jobs? Yeah. So we have a, a fair amount. I don't have the data on what kind of. Uh, uh, numbers of students that are entering into manufacturing specifically, but we have a lot of businesses that would hire 10 of them today, um, you know, specifically to manufacturing. We, we have a lot of support and a lot of momentum through our Central Wisconsin Metal Manufacturers Alliance, uh, which is an organized group of 55 manufacturers. They provide a lot of support. Uh, the Heavy Metal Tour, many of you have heard of, 
at the eighth grade level, but they also are doing things like holding welding competitions and machining competitions for our students, providing significant scholarship dollars uh, in those areas. So uh, to your point, Lee, there is a lot of opportunities for our graduates uh, in the area of manufacturing and um, in, in a variety. When I say manufacturing too, it's, it's wide in scale too. Wood, metal, manufacturing, welding, machining. So lots of opportunities there. These came off of our router over here. That was going to be our big demonstration, but I know you guys are moving on to automotive. This is so nice. <laughs> well, he gets a little extra. You want one? Sure. We've got plenty. I, I really love them. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you get a Wisconsin shoe. Let's do it. You can jump in at any point. Well, once you think. We're ready to go. We can show them how these are made. Okay. One, just one thing I want to mention, uh, the saw stop, and it goes for all of our areas. You know, when you come in here, it can be a little intimidating, right? And you, you worry about maybe safety issues. But one of the things that we've really paid a close attention to is buying equipment that's safe for our kids, right? And, and this saw stop is an example. Although it might be a little bit pricey, one of the things that this thing will do and it, it will detect a finger that comes anywhere close to that blade and will shut off immediately. Turn it on. <laughs> We've, uh, it's a good assistant. <laughs> so we're, we're proud of the fact that, uh, yes, we can as expose students to this, but we're also doing it with safety in mind. So um, with that, Jake, I think, has a demonstration over here on yeah. the CNC router. I just spoke with the representatives from SawStop, and, and they're just happy they invented it because it could bring tech ed back to schools. A lot of schools were afraid to have old, old school table saws in their shops. So this is the wood version of what you were just watching upstairs, the plasma cutter. This is a CNC controlled router. And uh, these axes we're handing out, feel free to grab one if you didn't get one already. These were cut out on here. Um, Travis, the student who was gonna run it for you, had to go to his mom's birthday party. So he split about 10 minutes ago. He said it was all ready to go, so I'm assuming that's all I have to do is close it up and press go. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Let's see if that works. <laughs> John, can you turn that, that switch behind you to on? It's going to get a little loud. We have our dust collector to turn on here. So he zeroed this up on the center of this sheet of plywood. That seems right. So what it's doing is it's cutting, excuse me, cuts out the uh, center portions of letters first. So if you were to cut the profile first, um, things get loosey-goosey, and then it would all be jittering around as it did the center. So you cut the small parts first, then you cut out the profile afterwards.
Lizzie, we'd take some sandpaper and shine it up. Yeah. Good to go. Nice. One of the things I will also mention about this particular machine is this is the machine that we use to make all the beds out at the school forest. Mm. And so oh, cool. it can literally cut out the wood uh, in exactly how you want it so that you can snap it all together. And, uh, and so that's uh, just another example of what this particular machine can do. Anything else? Um, well, Jake, can I just ask, when, yeah. you talk, when you say CNC, when they hear, you know, com computer numeric coding, yep. are the students taught in how much coding, what exactly does that mean with the language or what we're, they have to understand, mathematics or what otherwise? Um, really, we're, we're using uh, software that does all that coding for us, okay. called vCard. It okay. converts graphic files to something that the CNC machines understand. Okay. We do have two CNC controlled um, knee mills, those big blue yep. machines yep. upstairs. Yep. Um, and those would require us to actually code in G-code to get them okay. to run. The teacher hasn't gotten up to speed on G-code yet well, hey, that's, on the yeah. long list, but hopefully this summer. With them. I mean, I remember yeah. when Brenton was here a year ago and we had Arrow and Viking or what have you, some of those students, when they did the leadership role, yep. they seemed to truly understand exactly what they were talking about. And then they had very lucrative either job offers yeah. or community uh, oh, yeah. workplaces were right. saying, we'll pay for your schooling at the next level right. because wow. of how impressed we they had, were by the students. We had students giving demonstrations yes. to our On industry partners and then they were handing them business cards yes. saying, okay, <laughs> Please we, call we'll me. hire you tomorrow. <laughs> really soon. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Well, it was really impressive. Yeah. John, we, we have some students that have taken the time. There was a day off and they came in here to just kind of demonstrate how this stuff is used and they just represent the very best of our school. So this is the Wassa School Board and our Superintendent of Schools and, um, that are here. So I'm just going to allow them to introduce themselves and if you could tell them what year in school you are. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going to start because I'm on this side. Uh, my name is Matthew Lancaster. I am a junior. And I don't actually know what else I'm supposed to say. <laughs> That's okay. That's great. I just, you've taken the time to come here tonight. I want them to know who you are. You want us to know what class we're in as well? Yep. yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm Peyton. Uh, I'm a sophomore and I'm in Woods 2. Yeah. I'm Brock Overton. I'm a freshman. I'm in Woods 1. I'm Manning Crowley. I'm a senior. I'm in uh, uh, Residential Construction and Occupational Mechanics 2. Let's go back. And, yeah. and I'm in Woods 1. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming in here tonight, okay? Thanks. Appreciate it very much. Okay, uh, so automotive. This is, uh, there's not another high school automotive shop like this in the state. What, what makes this unique uh, is the fact that it has the ability to train kids in automotive, diesel, as well as auto collision. And it also has an attached computer lab to it so that our students can get the information they need because a lot of it is sometimes just research based whereas it used to not necessarily be that way in automotive. So this is a, what I would consider a state of the art high tech automotive shop. Uh, some of the things that are going on in here and Aiden can talk about it too. Aiden is our uh, occupational mechanics two student so he has hit the, the, the capstone class and he also has a youth apprenticeship with uh, Fred Mueller in town. Um, and, and so he has been through it and, and experienced the whole entire program. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention quickly is we have two new programming type things happening here. Um, one of them is a partnership with NTC as well as the uh, Workforce Development. They have a program going on here in Auto Collision uh, where we have NTC instructors teaching auto collision here uh, during the afternoon evening time starting at 4 o'clock. So we have post-secondary students in a cohort being taught by uh, NTC instructors specifically to auto collision. We held the advisory committee here in the shop and we had 30, 30 different auto collision industry folks here um, talking about that program. It's, uh, it's pretty neat. It's a grant funded through the Department of Workforce Development. But again, an opportunity for our community to use this facility as well as our, our partners in post-secondary. Uh, the second thing, and Aiden, I'm not sure if you're a part of this one, but we just started a, a new opportunity for Oct Mechanics 2 students to complete a two-day internship. Are you signed up for that? Yeah, I got to go to Brickner's next week. 
So Aiden is going to spend two full days with a, an automotive tech at Brickner's working on very high level automotive maintenance and repair uh, where we don't necessarily have the time to spend on really high end maintenance. Um, he can spend two days with an auto tech learning things above and beyond what our curriculum has. And, and the really neat thing about it is it's, it's working on cars that are a part of a program called Wheels to Work which is really the, the secret and the sauce behind our program. It's our partnership with WTIA, Wisconsin Automotive Truck Education Association. And this group of folks uh, supply us vehicles. Our students work on them here in the shop, and then we donate them back into the community for families in need that need transportation. So it's, it's a wonderful partnership. Uh, and, and it continues to blossom and grow through this new two-day internship for our Oc Mechanics 2 students. Um, gives them a real authentic experience in the industry, but it also helps the community through Wheels to Work programs. The recipients of the Wheels to Work, do the students meet the recipients? We, we don't. We don't. In fact, neither, does, neither do our teachers. It, they go through a, a program where they take some uh, financial, financial planning classes, and there's a qualification for them to actually receive the car, but that's all facilitated through with, with TIA. And so our, our, pretty much our focus is just the, the general maintenance of the vehicles, and it also helps obviously to train our tomorrow's workforce in automotive, right? So, but no, we don't necessarily see but the, you know the recipients. Mm -hmm. We only we only get the wheels to work cars that need to be returned. Right. Yeah. So, Brett, if I can just just add something right here, as school board members, I'm just going to be just come right out and say it. These programs are every one of them that you you observe tonight are so important. But these students right here. What's really neat is like I sit at home and every once in a while I'll see a commercial from like Olson Tire or Fred Miller or, or Brickner's and I see our students. I mean, like, there they are. I mean, they were just in high school a couple years ago because transportation is one industry that cannot be outsourced. And, and, and our, our businesses, the auto world, they, they have such a connection here. And I know I'll see these students right here. I mean, I watch them each and every day and they come here and they're focused and they're hands-on learners and you know Mr. Poppy works with them and they're going places and, and they're gonna do a great job and in these classes they learn the soft skills that are necessary. I'll make this real quick. The only other thing I want to do and I don't want to embarrass you John but it's important for you as board members to know this. John said it over and over. Partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. John is our liaison with the community. That we have partners because of John's work on behalf of the district, and he does a phenomenal job of keeping that support and those resources coming in to provide the education to these students right here, because we can't do it alone. We need these partnerships. I started off this class freshman year in uh, auto awareness, which is just class, basically fundamentals on changing your oil, tires, how to maintain your vehicle, and then at that time, I was a ski instructor at Granite Peak, teaching anyone from five-year-old to 50-year-olds how to ski. And then my sophomore year, I realized that I wanted to go into the auto mechanics industry. And through the Watia program and Mr. Poppy and the classes here, he helped me get a job at Fred Miller just by knowing people in town that I was in a, at the Career Expo last year. I was hired on the spot for that industry. I've been there a year and a half now everything lined up perfectly. It's in this just shop alone, we can paint an entire car, have an entire mixing room with the same paint products and the same paint that I have at a full auto body dealership. It's the same exact computer program, everything like that. They're, we're tearing apart motors donated by Hyundai that are used in production cars today that you would see on the road. And that if any of you actually drive a Hyundai, are probably in your car right now. Um, all these hoists, we start off learning how to actually use the hoist, which is super important going into the workforce, because you have you have your own hoist there. Um, Poppy, Mr. Poppy is really important about returning tools back into that toolbox, 
and all of the C-Tech habits have, in, have tools in it that we have. And around the corner here is a tire changer and balancer, which we've all been had to be trained on, which in the workforce is coming to, you know, a key process. And like basically everything we've learned in this shop, I can't even say if there's one thing that I have that I've learned that I haven't used actually at my real job. Everything here matters more than in the actual shop. Like I believe Mr. Poppy does go above and beyond with showing how to do things in the shop that he wouldn't normally do. Especially him being, you know, kind of your old farming teacher. He knows those little tips and tricks on how to get things that you wouldn't know in the shop normally. And as board members, it's important what Bob was talking about when he's going over budget, keeping these yeah. teachers here. Oh, because yeah. there are different organizations that will try to lure them away. And you just heard it. That was the best testament to the importance of these programs, the importance of the teacher, and uh, you know, and look at the impact it's had on if these it young wasn't men. For Mr. Poppy's class and the tech department. I wouldn't have a job at Fred Miller just because based on some of the requirements you needed to get into. And uh, I don't remember who said it, but the NTC program here at uh, East After Hours, I actually enrolled in that for next year nice. based on it. And then Mr. Stoholbiak being the tech ed or teacher over there, uh, he's actually my old boss working for uh, Trap River Construction. So that's, I was the one that told him the position opened up for this and how I got that job. <laughs> But this, it's crazy important on how the tech ed plays in a role in the work. You know, like you said, transportation you cannot outsource. And especially, you know, the auto body where I come from, just the little things you learned here played a huge role there. It, I can't explain it enough that it's exactly like the real world in a shop. So. And if I can add on to it, it's not just a job. It's also, you know, just go home a little few, you know, maintenance and nicks or tricks there that you can do to, you know, get her going so you can keep on using it. And because of this class, it really digs deep and, you know, like how to get in and what tools you can use to really make it better. And, we say prepare kids to be college, career, and life ready, right? So these are things you can use in your life as well. There's, awesome. There's colleges out there that email you before you email them, asking you to come to their college. Um, I've had UTI email me and text me saying that they want us out there. And many of the alumni is from this school, like for an example, John Krieger. Um, his dad's a body manager at Brickner's, now is at Toyota of Lhasa. Uh, his schooling was paid for by UTI. He went to NASCAR Tech, worked on uh, Jeff Gordon's team for two years, and now is back in Wausau as a tech at Kershurik, making more money than he thought he would make his freshman year. And he learned that all just because of three years in auto class that you wouldn't expect. And that he is building cars that go 200 miles an hour on a track. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the tour. Uh, if you guys ever have questions or you want to, um, you know, ask questions or go see Wassel West CT, give me a call. I'd be happy to happy to answer any questions or or give you a tour of West sometimes.